Yeah, so I don't know if it's been kept. Instead of doing like the previous days, you were able to see it on YouTube. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see. Hi. Well, tech, yes. yes. Um, so we sent them to the email. The Siege email? Yeah. So I think, um, yeah. I can just log into mine, I guess. <laughs> So there's um there's presentation one, uh, Julie Jimenez. Did they share it with the drive or? I'm not sure. I just emailed it to the email that they told us to send it to. Is it Siege Symposium? Yeah. Or? Mm -hmm. Put it, yeah, Julie. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Or I can resend it right now if you want. I guess. I think I did day three. 3B. I actually have a conference in, in Minnesota, so I had to leave my family in Montreal when they left me. Is it this one? Mm -mm. And they, they went to the um, I can just forward it if that's if that works. Yeah. These are two of them, and then he has one that I think he has in a thumb drive or he sent it recently. So, so Siege. Um, Actually, do you want to just send it to my email? Whatever works, yeah. It's rhu1129 at turfmail, T-E-R-P, T-E-R-P, mail, dot umd dot umd. Dot umd. Is that good? Yeah. I'm going to see if I can. And, and, and here. Yeah. Very close. Yeah. Very close. Yeah. You send it? Is this your email? RHU. Yes. Oh, is it this yeah. one? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what am I supposed to do? So I just... those are, yeah, if you can just open both of them, and then um, that's going to be the first presentation that we do. 
If oh, like Google Docs is fine, yeah, because I did on Google Docs. <laughs> um, and then, and then second one. Uh, download, yeah. Able. Um, he ha you have a thumb drive or? I can email? send it to. Um, can I send it to? Yeah. So send it to this So there's three in it's, it's a link, so you can open it up in a tab. Give me one second really quick. So this is the second one, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So letting you get a download or earn? It's letting me download, but I don't think it's letting me open. Yeah. That's for the second slide, though. Yeah, then. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try the... Okay, the third slide is fine. Is that it? That's, that's mine. Mm -hmm. But you're... You um, Gabriela, do you mind how you use a Google Drive, or is it just... No, she's having trouble downloading it over here. Oh, I'll just give you that thumb drive. Oh, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> what the heck? It's, uh, I think it's the name of the company. Um, I think putting it in Google okay, Drive kind yeah. of messed, messed it up. Messed it up, yeah. Um, maybe the PDF then. Okay, give me one second. Let me X out of this. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Good, how are you? Oh, wait, sorry. Where are you joining from? This is your first one, right? Yeah. Where are you joining from? I'm joining from Frederick. Ah, okay. I'm going to see you in one of your events. Um, I, if I can present I it like it that. It's fine because oh, so I don't want to miss it. Yeah. Like this? Yeah, that's fine. Are you sure? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. And then I this is your college. third one. Yeah. And then your second one is... Um. So here's the um thumb drive. Mm -hmm. Does this have a thumb drive? I should, right? I have no idea. Oh, oh no. Is it on this side? Oh, okay. Yeah. Huh. How do you say your last name? Well, that's my husband's name. Uh, oh, it says there's a problem. Okay. Scan and fix. Yeah, so Continue without scanning. Also, I have this company. Not sure. You don't have it like in a Google Doc or anything? Knowing more about the needs of the Latino. Well, I'm Latino from Brazil. We'll see. Uh -huh. Okay. Which one is it? Um, Gabriella. This one? Yeah. So that's my partner. Oh, no. No, that's that's my resume. <laughs> Sorry. Is it this uh, it one? should read. Okay, go down to. Are you on my, my thumb drive? Yes. There should be a PowerPoint. I'm not the Latino, but go down further. This is the end. Scoot up. <laughs> it was titled Power. Uh, <laughs> Energy versus power and value. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is. How do I? All right. So when it's it's that time for her, I'll just pull it up here, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And then this is your third one. <laughs> and where's the first one? I feel like they are completely, completely outside. And I also want to engage them <coughs> This one? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. I can keep it up while I do the intros. Okay. Yeah, maybe not do open Google Docs because that messed it up. Yeah, let me just close everything else so it's easier. Do you want me to close everything? Um, maybe keep the email up just in case I need to find the other ones, but... Okay. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. No worries. So then, that's it. Yeah, we'll just keep it there. Okay, is there anything else we need to do? Make sure and present it would be like this, right? So you guys have been my Okay. Then Abel's is here. Okay. Got it. Okay. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Charlottesville. Do you know how how um I would tell we should end this one? Oh, I don't have a program with it, but. Is it the, Should we just end the time we're supposed to, or can we run over a little bit? I think we'll go over a little bit because we're running late today. Okay. And we're not going to cut down any of the time for our sessions. Wait, thank you. So maybe. I think we're good. Thank you. Yeah. Unless you want to stay and watch, then no problem. Yeah. We should, I guess, just start. Let's just get started. They're also like if you need to get started to the village, okay. like if you need to get started, or even like what's your educational material that you want to be charged? Unfortunately, we can't do that. Yeah. Pro bono, we won't charge. Mm -hmm. It's just my interest and my party to really like to also bring environmental awareness to this museum community that we have here. Okay, yes. okay almost, uh, I think we're going to get started. Sorry to interrupt your conversation. Um, but I think uh, we want to um, you know, definitely um, respect your time too, so I know we're running a little bit late. Um, but uh, before we start, I just want to take a poll because um, we have the ability of doing this in either Spanish or English. So. Do you, do you all prefer, or by show of hands, can you speak and understand Spanish? <laughs> the two great yeah, audience members. <laughs> Whatever you want. I can, I can understand Spanish. Okay. okay. Then, do you guys know Spanish? No importa. No quiero muy bien. Me da igual, me quiero todo. No, That's all I can say. That and obrigado. <laughs> in, in Spanish, okay. Can we do Spanish? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You can practice oh, going Spanish. Like this. She's going to be rolling. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, yeah, all players, folks, come on in. Um, uh, so, we're going to be doing a session in English and Spanish, kind of back and forth. Um, so, bienvenidos al uh, octavo simposio anual de justicia ambiental. Um, y bienvenidos a la sesión titulada Asuntos de Justicia Ambiental um, y la Población Latina en el GMB. Uh, so esta sesión, uh, los, los panelistas discutirán la historia de los problemas de justicia ambiental, climática y energía que han impactado a las poblaciones latinas en el GMB. Um, además, compartirán su experiencia y conocimiento como expertos uh, y activistas sobre esos temas y discutirán los desafíos, los impactos, uh, las lecciones aprendidas y las mejores prácticas. Y también ofrecerán estrategias que pueden emplear para aumentar la participación de los latinos en el movimiento um, justicia ambiental en GMB. Um, entonces, vamos a primero comenzar con introducciones. Um, y yo me llamo Julie Jiménez. Y yo, um, mis pronombres de género es ella, she, her, ella. Um, y actualmente soy um, uh, estudiando uh, en grad school, <laughs> um, enfocándome en el uh, transporte, equitable transportation and mobility. Um, y ha pasado los, los últimos seis años uh, viviendo en GMB, pero estoy uh, enfocándome en policía, trabajando en policías federales uh, climáticas y otras um, uh, problemas ambientales. Um, soy originariamente de Los Ángeles, California, y um, uh, first generation Mexican American, and um, estoy muy feliz de estar aquí con ustedes hoy. Um, y ahora les voy a, um, I'll turn it over to our panelists. Um, so if you can please um, say your name, your preferred gender pronoun, um, uh, tell us a little bit about your work and how this, how this um, relates to this session. I'll start with uh, 
Ay, hola, yo soy Gabriela Lemus, soy la directora ejecutiva de Maryland Latinos Unidos. Uh, mis pronombres son she, her, ella. Uh, también uh, soy originaria de México, um, nacida en la Ciudad de México, pero criada en San Juan, Puerto Rico. Entonces digo siempre que soy Borimex, uh, Boricua Mexicana. Um, y uh, eso me ha impactado como individuo, como persona, um, por, eh, bueno, en todo lo que he hecho. Uh, tengo un doctorado en relaciones internacionales, uh, pero me especializo en cuestiones fronterizas, inclusive en cuestiones del medio ambiente. Um, en mi trabajo de Maryland Latinos Unidos, um, es una organización muy nueva. Uh, vamos apenas en septiembre, vamos a cumplir tres añitos. Uh, thank you, thank you. You were there when I started. Um, um, uh, y, um, y parte del trabajo que estamos haciendo es levantar los temas del medio ambiente y los problemas climáticos para la comunidad hispana, porque obviamente um, en Maryland estamos creciendo muy rápidamente, pero también hay poca información para nosotros y hay uh, poco esfuerzo de, de buscar hablar con la comunidad acerca de estos temas. Entonces, no solamente tenemos que levantar uh, de, la, la educación dentro de la comunidad de por sí, para que entiendan, pero también dentro de las agencias gubernamentales ¿no? y, y de las ONGs que están trabajando con nuestras comunidades para mejor entender cómo esto nos afecta. En particular, ustedes escucharon al Reverend Yearwood, quien habló de, de la, la pobre niña que murió de asma. Eso también está pasando en nuestras comunidades. Entonces, cuestiones de temas uh, respiratorios, etcétera. Cuando estamos hablando de equidad de salud, uh, estamos como entre uh, las dos comunidades afroamericanas y, la, y, y anglosajonas. ¿no? Y entonces, uh, muchas veces no sabemos cómo integrarnos mejor. Y, um, y, y dónde cabemos, pues. Y, y entonces, parte de ello eh, es lo que quiero discutir con ustedes, también escuchar de ustedes, porque como somos un grupito pequeño, podemos intercambiar, yo creo, creo yo, bastantes ideas. Ahora, ¿shall I pass it over? Yes, I will pass it over to mi colega Abel Olivo. Gracias. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Abel Olivo, soy el director ejecutivo de Defensores de la Cuenca. Uh, somos una organización uh, nuevo también, uh, casi dos años. Uh, uh, trabajamos para involucrar a la comunidad latina, uh, básicamente creando eventos para conectar con la, la naturaleza, para tener las experiencias positivas, uh, para crear oportunidades uh, para esta comunidad, uh, para crecer su conocimiento acerca de la naturaleza, Uh, para, o, últimamente para crear líderes para el futuro en este espacio. Uh, puedo presentar más información de, después durante la presentación, pero creo que podemos empezar. Yeah. Uh, PowerPoint. Yes. I'm going to switch okay. over to English now because <laughs> um, I did my presentation in English. Um, so um, I did this more to set the stage and just give a little bit more background of, you know, why we're here, why these conversations are important about Latinos um, and, the, and the DMV around environmental justice. Um, so let's see. I'm not, I'm used to my Mac. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so to give you a background, um, Latino populations in the Mid-Atlantic, um, including the DMV region, face a greater number of environmental challenges than their white counterparts. These populations are overrepresented in neighborhoods with industrial pollution, heavy traffic roadways, poor housing infrastructure, limited access to green space, urban heat islands, impaired waterways, and more. The different burden of environmental hazards and locally unwanted land uses also called LULs, inequities in built and natural infrastructure and disparities in exposure to stressors can be linked to systemic racism in the form of environmental racism. These issues on top of many other unique challenges present unimaginable hardships that affect health, quality of life and um, educational and economic opportunity. Economic opportunity. 
So here's a snapshot of, you know, the population in the DMV, um, uh, Latino populations. So um, we can see that in Virginia, Latinos make up 10.5% of the total population. And they, the Latinos primarily live in Prince William and Fairfax counties. In Maryland, um, the Latinos make up 11.8% of the total population and primarily live in Prince George and Montgomery County. Um, and in Washington, D.C., Latinos make up 11.3% of the po population, um, mostly live in Columbia Heights and Mount Pleasant neighborhoods. So the following slides will highlight some of the ways that Latinos are impacted by environmental racism. Um, so in this quote, you know, while air pollution has improved um, across the country and the, and the DMV, um, you know, in the last couple of decades, thanks to the Clean Air Act, um, the benefits of cleaner air are actually not distributed um, evenly. So across the country, um, including the DMV and certain communities, we know that Black, Asian, Latinos, and low-income populations are being exposed to higher levels of dangerous ozone pollution, also known as smog, um, and particulate matter, PM 2.5, due to where they live, work, and go to school. For example, many of us live near highway, highway, high traffic roadways and work in industries that require us to be outdoors, like in agriculture and construction. And to give just a bit of background of what we mean by ozone and particulate matter, ozone, so the science, a little bit behind it, um, hard for me to grasp a little bit, but I think it's important to know what makes up these particles. Um, so ozone, aka smog, is formed by nitri nitrous, nitrogen oxide, NOx, and organic compounds from tailpipe from cars and trucks, um, and also smoke smokestacks and other sources when they come into contact with sunlight. Um, as far as particular matter, um, it is a mix of tiny invisible solid and liquid particles that are highly concentrated near traffic corridors, um, industrial areas, and in wildfire smoke. Um, so according to the American Lung Association, both ozone and particular pollution have detrimental impacts on public health, causing asthma, cancer, and premature death. And so just a couple of um, data from the latest State of the Air report by the American Lung Association um, in the DMV. So the DMV metro area ranked 30th for high ozone days out of 226 metropolitan areas. The DMV area ranked 63rd for 24-hour particle pollution out of 221 metropolitan areas and ranked 75th for annual particle pollution out of 202 metropolitan areas. Um, so due to a legacy of racism, as mentioned, um, Latinos are more likely to live in areas with high exposure to hazardous waste and high concentrations of air pollution. The following are ways that environmental racism shows up in Latino communities. So we are higher, we have higher exposure to industrial pollution. As mentioned, we, um, uh, I've, I've mentioned this already, but you know, just to really drill it in, <laughs> we live near high traffic corridors and we are um, at higher exposure breathing in these toxic fumes from cars and trucks, truck exhaust. Because of the disproportionate exposure to this pollution, Latinos are twice as likely to go to the emergency room for asthma and other respiratory illnesses. We also have um, poor infrastructure. Um, you know, we, a lot of Latinos lack affordable housing options and energy efficient homes. Um, nationwide, 45% of Latino households have reported challenges paying their energy bills. Um, energy efficiency plays a key role in keeping energy bills low. And according to census data, um, Latinos are more likely to live in older, less energy efficient homes in the general population. Um, in addition, because they live in older homes, many live in homes with lead contamination um, that can also be found in pipes and in drinking water. And, according to, and across the country, Latinos are 21% more likely than whites to live in urban heat islands, uh, which can be up to 22 degrees Fahrenheit hotter um, than rural and urban areas, also um, due to the lack of green spaces. And finally, um, we see disinvestment. Um, you know, because of decades of racist, red line, and discriminatory, discriminatory lending policies, um, Latinos disproportionately live near hazardous waste facilities that result in high exposure to hazardous waste and concentrations of air pollution than the white population in the U.S. 
um, Latinos also face economic disparities, which threaten our resilience to climate change. The average wealth of Latino households is only 6,300 compared to white households who have an average net worth of 140,000. That is a large disparity, large gap. Uh, the wealth gap leads to a lack of access to healthcare, quality housing, exposure to higher levels of pollution, and less ability to recover from major weather events exacerbated by climate change. Um, and then my last slide, um, I wanted to drive home the message that, you know, despite all these challenges, we care about climate change. Uh, excuse me. There's been some polling done in recent years about Latinos' um, attitudes towards climate change. A Pew Research study um, published in 2020, October 2021 found that most Latinos in the U.S. say global climate change is an important uh, concern, with the majority saying that it affects their local community. Um, and in addition, uh, in March 2020, uh, Latinos' decision polls said that 76% of Latino voters said it was extremely important that government take steps to pass legislation. And in 2019, a poll by Yale Climate Communication Center found that Latinos are more alarmed or concerned about global warming than, you, uh, than the U.S. white or black residents. Um, so in addition to caring about climate change, Latinos have been uh, cultural environmentalists. Um, you know, our culture is rooted in conservation. For, from reusing or repurposing plastic bags to the rich conservation practices that have been passed down from our indigenous ancestors, um, Latinos are ready to take on climate action. And that is my presentation. And here's my information if anybody wants to reach out or has any additional questions. Oops. Hola y muchas gracias. Um, my presentation is a little bit more around my organization, as these were the questions that were asked of me. But what I'd like to do is perhaps set it up in such a way Um, y, y lo puedo hacer también en español, um, si, si es necesario, um, to really engage in, in more of a conversation, take some of the points that um, she just made and um, apply them more locally. My organization is only focused on the state of Maryland, uh, Maryland Latinos Unidos, obvio. Um, and um, we are very young. We're, like I said in my presentation, my introduction, uh, tenemos dos añitos, estamos apenas, vamos a cumplir tres. Um, so I wanted to hyper-localize this for you because, um, you know, she mentioned Prince George's and Montgomery County, but the reality is there's five counties in the state of Maryland where over almost 70% of the population resides. That includes Anne Arundel, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, uh, Montgomery, and Prince George's. Now, what I also wanted to do was um, point out to you, I don't think we can raise this up, but um, that... Um, It's not just by percentage. So if you look at the 17 to 21% growth in Montgomery, for example, when you start looking at the real numbers, it's fairly significant. So that I believe, can I shut that off, the Banneker thing? A ver. There we go. Okay, so it, you see it's 165,398 to 217,409. And, you know, it's one thing to see the percentage change. It's another thing to see the actual numbers. It's quite significant. And I think something for me that's really fascinating is how Anne Arundel is now 23.8. I mean, not Anne Arundel, I'm sorry. The city of Annapolis, we associate, we don't associate it with Latinos, but it's almost 25% Latino, which is, it's really high. Um, and what that means is that um, as this community grows and continues to grow, Um, we have to be prepared in terms of the services we provide as nonprofits. Mine is a nonprofit agency. We're actually housed inside Maryland Nonprofits Association. Um, but also um, as government agencies to work with the community and help them through um, their, you know, literally their growing pains. We're also very young. Almost 31% of the community is under the age of 18. So this is um, 
says a lot and and for the future, but also the fact that um, so many of our young kids, about 21% of the school system right now is Latino in the state. Now you go to Prince George's and Montgomery County and it's actually closer to 40%. Um, what does that mean? It means that there's a lot of room and space for literally for more growth, but also for learning and education. And it's our young community that is really involved in the environmental space. And you'll, you'll hear more directly from Abel um, what, uh, what we're seeing with our youth. Um, now, one thing I do know is, um, you know, I was asked, how does Maryland Latinos Unidos, how does MLU invest in the community? And we're what we call a think and do tank. Um, we're trying to do everything on the basis of strong research, right? And with our members, we have about 300 members in our association um, and our partners, because we do a lot of coalition building and, and we particularly, we've developed a model through COVID um, to partner with uh, other organizations. Uh, like, for example, we created a coalition called the Mid-Atlantic Latinx Vaccine Equity Coalition, MELVIC for short, which is now thankfully changed and evolved uh, into LEA. And LEA stands for the Latino Health Equity Alliance. And through that alliance and that uh, coalition, what ended up happening is we started MLU getting very involved in uh, health equity commissions. And through the health equity commissions, we have used this as a springboard to introduce the issue of environmental health in the health equity commissions in Montgomery County, Prince George's County, and now in uh, at the state level, the governor appointed me to the commission. Um, I was kind of loud um, <laughs> to um, to participate and you know build out uh, the best practices part. They they made me chair of the best practices working group. This is a new commission. is only a, it's not even a year old, and um, and it's important because um, as these as the state and local governments really engage with. Um, the idea of the env environmental justice as a health equity issue, it's critical that Latinos be at the table. And the challenge for me is I'm often the only one, and I don't want to be the only one. I want all of you at the table with me or filling other tables, and we have to share this outward. Um, our organization, because we're very small, we only focus on those five counties that I mentioned at the beginning. And um, because that's where, like I said, almost 70% of the population lies and you know, I'm, I'm having to do everything at the same time, right? We're building the plane, we're flying the plane, we're inviting you to get on board the plane that's not well built yet. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge. However, um, it's critical that resources be brought to the table. You, you heard the numbers that um, Reverend Yearwood mentioned during the lunch. Uh, the proportion of resources being invested in environmental justice is very low. But also, there's another challenge in Maryland that happens to our community in particular, and it's data. It's data gathering. It's very difficult to find data on Latinos. And during COVID, what we found was we were being classified as other. So at the beginning, there was nothing. They didn't really start collecting our data till April 2021. And then by April 2022, it was hard to find again. And so this is going to be something to think about and fight for from the advocacy perspective, which is where I'm going to... Uh, take you now because this is how we invest in the community. So through um, through the, um, the, the health equity piece that we started via COVID, we realized that a big chunk of our work had to be with community engagement. So what we've done is we've started engaging in community surveys. We do convenings, monthly convenings, and um, again, coalition building and alliances. Our, our Malvec coalition is composed of Johns Hopkins University, George Washington University. So we have big, heavy academic groups. We have CASA, which is massive nonprofit here uh, for the Latino community. We've also been uh, working together with the city of Annapolis, specifically with their programs so that we can get to the Latino community to, uh, again, bring resources to the table. But there's something else that we're doing. Through that community engagement, we're building trust. And we're, you have to 
the messenger is probably in some ways more important than the message. And then that leads us to advocacy planning because with that information that we get from the community, we can then plan out how we will engage and from that advocacy planning comes our policy development. Um, now, it's hard, we're a small staff. At this point, uh, we're only five, we're down from eight, um, which in a very short period of time is actually pretty quick to grow. Um, but it, um, if I wasn't housed as a Latino nonprofit inside Maryland Nonprofits Association, it would be much harder for me to get access to the resources because that's a 30 year old organization that is lending me its support and its technical assistance so that I can build out and then in turn provide technical assistance and capacity building support to Latino organizations that are just getting started are, are started and are not fun being, they're having a trouble being sustainable because they're doing this all the time. They're spending all their time and energy solving the problem and not being able to focus on a bigger picture. So this leads me to the specific op opportunities that we engage in, which is we have a, hold a monthly people's policy series. We also hold a cafecito virtual, which is, um, an introduction of our Latino leaders in Spanish. Um, and it, you know, it's important because one of the things I'm finding as I work with the school systems is that a lot of our kids are falling through the cracks. And um, I was just in a meeting uh, two, three weeks ago regarding Prince George's and they, they gave me a horrible statistic and I need to go back and verify this, but apparently Latino male youth in Prince George's are only graduating at 17%. If that's the case, that's criminal. That's criminal. But that affects all of this because what are they doing? They are probably working in all of those low paying jobs outdoors uh, in construction, uh, but in those heat pockets where it's 22 degrees higher. So what that does for me is it makes my my policy thinking slightly prioritized slightly differently perhaps than another um, environmental organization might think about it, like one of the big greens, for example. So this is a community survey that I did between January and April and the results we got them in June. And um, one, you know, it's divided into these three pieces, social and economic justice. And then I, I put in environmental justice by itself because I really wanted to test the waters with our members and our partners to see what they had to say. We reached out to about, I think it's a small number, um, about 300 leaders. And I think I got a response rate of 54, which is not very high. So it's really a sample survey. But this was the top on the left, you see social and economic issues. The top issue for them in April, May of this year was access to healthcare, followed by Latino representation, the lack of representation in government, the lack of representation in the healthcare system, even in leadership in schools and everything, there's no teachers. Um, if we're 21% of the student body, you would hope that the teaching body and the assistants and those people would, would reflect that, but it does not. Uh, now, in terms of, we often think of Latinos being in the English language space, right? So 9% of the student body in the state of Maryland is English, are, I should, excuse me, my bad English, are English language learners. Of that, 75% of them are Spanish speakers, Spanish dominant. However, this is interesting. Most of them, you know, they started in the elementary school. By the time they get to middle school, they're already integrated, right? Now there's another pocket on the high school side that's smaller, um, but they are also, um, they, they're, they're having a little bit of a harder time learning the language perhaps. And so their transition into the English language classes is a little bit slower and often not as effective. As we get older, our brains are not as plastic, uh, um, which unfortunately. <laughs> the third issue that, and, and you mentioned this as well, was affordable housing. So affordable housing in our area, we know it's ridiculously expensive. Our median wage in the state is only 56,000 whereas the median household income is 84,000 for the state. Now we know that um, many of our households are um, intergenerational 
or uh, multiple families. It's not just inter my family, for example, my parents live with me um, now that they have retired. Um, that, that's pretty common in our community. But what happens because the housing is less affordable is we are in smaller spaces. And to your point about having less efficient homes because we're living in older homes, it also means that we have less ventilation or we don't use our ventilation as, as often as we might because we can't afford the utility bills. And that obviously impacted us during COVID. Um, I talked to a uh, doctor at Johns Hopkins University, and she says she believes that Johns Hopkins, the, the patients at Johns Hopkins, the sadly who got COVID and, and died and ended up hospitalized, it was closer to 21% were Latino. Now she says she can't, she doesn't have the data for that, but she, that's what she believes just from her seeing that and serving them. That's what she was seeing. It was that high. This is a challenge for us because it means that there's other health issues, health equity impacts that are equally problematic. And for me, air and water quality are really, really important because uh, we don't talk about air quality as much as we used to because of the 1970 Clean Air Act. And um, the reality is um, our community throughout the country, we tend to live more likely to live near utility plants or near ports or near um, industrial spaces or near highways. And um, you know, the other thing is when we working these lower paid jobs, a high paying job for us might be in the trucking industry, right? Where we have diesel trucks and we're standing in line at the port inhaling those fumes from the diesel trucks. And this again is causing challenges beyond just respiratory because then it starts impacting your entire circulatory system. Um, there, I, I wish I'd pulled this data point, but I was looking at something related to Teflon and Teflon is air particulate. And um, it is uh, a study that I saw from, um, I believe it was Johns Hopkins, um, basically implied that young Latinas in developmental age were being so impacted by this Teflon that it was leading to obesity and type two diabetes. Not something you think about when you talk about environmental justice, but particulate matters really do impact the chemistry of your body in different ways. So the other issues on the social and economic justice points, economic justice, uh, fair wages, progressive taxes, um, food insecurity and injustice, and of course the criminal justice system treatment unfairly. What I found fascinating uh, on the environmental side is number one issue, uh, and this you'll be happy to hear this, is transportation. <laughs> um, uh, it's uh, reliable public, but also safe transportation. And um, they want to see, our community wants to see investment in our communities, especially when we know that we have challenges and we, we don't have the information to explain it. Um, access to green space is also an issue, but what was interesting, I, and this was not in the top, top line, it was in a, one of the sub questions. Um, what was interesting about the access to green space, those who said they had access to green space were only going outdoors maybe twice a week, maybe once a week for two hours, three hours, four hours, not much. So this also impacts um, our our ability to be healthy as well because of lack of exercise. The, of course, clean air and potable water, but also sustainable agriculture, which I found, I was actually very pleased that we were aware enough and thinking through this enough because this is also an area where our community lives. So whereas we're focused, I'm focused mostly on this these five counties, when you go to the Eastern shore, you start seeing other challenges. You start seeing like the poultry plants in very small spaces, ammonia impacts um, in the water quality, but also in the air quality. And this is, you know, these they're, they're very small tracts of land and they are, um, increasing the number of chickens, I you know that sounds really basic, but I'm um, not very scientific, but the number of chickens that they're placing there, and this is causing all kinds of disease problems. So how do you can get involved with us? Um, we have CHOs in the five counties, our community health organizers. Now these community health organizers are organizing at the county level. They're not community health workers, but because we partner with these nonprofits, we have access to a hundred and over 154, I believe, community health workers who have been trained in digital organizing and using WhatsApp as networking, et cetera, to connect people to resources. Um, 
we have broadened our health equity program, and that's why we're now Latino Health Equity Alliance to include youth and mental health, environmental health, uh, COVID, of course, we continue doing this work because this is going to, it, yes, the CDC said, you know, things are better, but we still have to be cautious. And our community did not get their second, third, second vaccine. Many got their first. So we, the numbers look really good, but the reality is they didn't get their second vaccination in, in large numbers and even less the boosters. And it has to do with the impact of those, those of you, I know if you've had your shot, you know, some days you, some of them work, some of them don't. The other is to become a member of our organization, participate in our surveys and partner with us when we build coalitions out. Um, our, um, we made three big policy recommendations this year to the state legislature related to disproportionate climate impacts. But again, this is the devils in the details, right? Um, we really were concerned about undocumented populations being impacted by climate crises and not an emergency services. So I've been talking to the emergency services to ensure that they are reaching out into our communities and helping them think through how they're going to do community engagement. Uh, but they need funding to do this, right? There's this habit that if you're bilingual, somebody, anybody can do it, but it's not true. Really, this should be, I mean, we should, um, so I am advocating for that as well. Um, but um, also access to funding and green jobs. Again, we work outdoors, make sure that funding is going to resources to ensure that these people get their time off so that they don't get sick, uh, you know, for, for farms. Uh, you know, if you're bringing in farm workers, make sure you have adequate housing, you know, and that's part of it too. Um, and then lastly, um, oh, that was last. Okay, moving on. That's it. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> Um, I'll be very quick with my remarks because I think that it would be great and, and useful to have a dialogue. Uh, again, my name is Abel Olivo. We're here uh, at the Environmental Justice Issues and Latino Populations in the DMV. Um, this is my presentation. Um, here I am. Again, Abel, there's my email address. A bit about me. Um, I'm a um, fourth-generation Chicano from Ohio. Uh, my parents are one of 16. My mom had 15 brothers and sisters. My dad had 15 brothers and sisters. Uh, I have over, over 170 first cousins. Um, of the cousins, uh, about uh, a third of us graduated from high school and about 15 of us went to university and graduated. Why do I say that? Because even though we have the privilege of, of being citizens of this country, we still faced challenges that many of our immigrant population face, uh, knowing that first and foremost, the priorities in our communities is money, putting food on the table, rent, car payments, gasoline. We care about the environment, we care about nature, but every one of those things will always come first, always. And it's the recognizing that in, in, in my experiences working with not only for my own family, but working with the community really drives that, that point home to me all the time. This is my co-founder, Lindo Morales. He's an agronomist from Guatemala. Uh, he's uh, super knowledgeable, uh, an immigrant as well, who um, came to this country and kind of you know brought the love of nature and the environment and really didn't really see a whole lot going on in that space. Uh, yes, there are organizations and programs that engage the Latino Spanish speaking community, but in a way that is really one sided. Uh, come plant our trees and pick up our trash uh, and then see you next month. We, we report back to our funder and we look for more money. Uh, that's not that's not just. Uh, so again, uh, Defensores de la Cuenca, we work to engage the, the Spanish-speaking community through creating shared experiences. Uh, we want to create positive experiences in nature so that people want to continue to engage, they want to come back, they want to be with us. 
Uh, we share information about those connections that, that Gabby and Julie uh, shared about health, uh, access to nature, um, how, how asthma impacts educational attainment. That, uh, you know, if as, as a young um, a student who is having trouble breathing and your first language is, is Spanish, you're going to school and man, like, this is hard. And then layer on that a health uh, issue, chronic health. I can't pay attention. I can't breathe. I, I don't understand this stuff. I'm going to drop out. I'm going to get a job. That talks about long term economic opportunities. Right. So helping to explain those those connections and the importance of of, of a clean environment, uh, building networks of uh, Latino, Latina and Latin leaders for the community, as was mentioned here, the messenger is as important as the message. And sometimes you can't even get to the message if it's not the right messenger. So having more people, more Latinos, more Latinas, more Latinas out there engaging their communities directly. Uh, like I said, I'm a fourth generation Chicano from Ohio. I don't have the same access or the same experiences as a recent arrival from Central America and, and even go deeper than that, Guatemala or, you know, even the indigenous communities. So being there and being present to engage your communities in a very familiar way is super important. Uh, as was mentioned, again, um, 19% uh, of our of the United States population, again, estimates, uh, or 60.6 .6 million uh, uh, in July 20, 2019, estimated to grow to almost 30% or 11 million by 2060. Uh, this is Latinos across the Chesapeake Bay watershed, 24.5% in Prince William County, 11.6% Easton, 38.9% in Lancaster, 26.6% uh, .6 in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Right. These numbers also don't tell the story of concentration mm -hmm. where I live in Prince George's County. It's over 20 percent of the population. However, 70 percent of the community is Spanish speaking Latinos. Right. You go to a CVS or a McDonald's or uh, wherever and they greet you in Spanish. Right, the schools. If you look at the school uh, populations, the self-identified uh, uh, enrollments, 70, 80, 90 percent of the population. This is from Prince George's. All of, this is, you know, hundreds of thousands of people concentrated in one area. So the the numbers tell a little bit of the story, but when we look a little deeper, we we can tell that those pockets are are very uh, um, intense. Um, so. Again, working to recognize the barrier language, um, that's the most obvious. Uh, we cater to or engage Spanish speaking communities, um, regardless of where you're from. We don't necessarily have the skills or the capacity to engage Portuguese, I'm sorry, or indigenous language, mom even, or dialects. That we That's not something that, that we have the capacity to do. Uh, However, we work to support those folks who, who do that work. We just don't. Uh, we're asking for people's most precious commodity, and that's their time. Time away from work, time away from church, time away from family. So when we engage, we work to recognize that and, and weave in some of those priorities or all the priorities as we can. And as was mentioned before, we work to build trust. Even though we have been given a certain level of trust by our participants. We know that we continue to uh, need to continue to to grow that trust. Um, intentions that, that lead to connecting. So, again, recognizing some of those 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 uh, challenges to the community, uh, environmental justice issues that were were spoken, access to green space, tree canopy, impervious surfaces. We're not there necessarily to ask everyone to solve global climate change. That's not fair and that's not just. We're there to um, help nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10, their priorities don't look anything like our priorities at all. Their priorities are what Gabby put up there, right? So we look at it in a way of helping them accomplish their priorities, take a little bit off their plate so that they can serve themselves what we're offering. We're not trying to lump the problems onto them. Um, so we, we you know, work 
to with that lens of environmental justice. Uh, we definitely think that the partnerships uh, with local community groups is important. And from, from um, not necessarily our perspective, but from a white-led organization that's looking to partner or to make connections to uh, the communities uh, of color, Black, African American, Latino, Spanish speaking, or others, indigenous, certainly uh, LGBTQ, Asian American, uh, you need to partner with organizations on the ground. Um, and in that, that process, as an organization, you help build cultural capacity uh, and understanding that will allow you to better serve the, the community in terms of creating policies, creating programs, creating more access. Uh, so in that, you are also helping yourself as an organization to support a diverse workforce. Um, and I know that some of my, my, my colleagues don't like to hear this when, when, when I say this white dominant organization can't host a person of color properly. And they're like, what? I'm doing just fine. Yeah, you are. You are. But generally speaking, uh, Black, African American, uh, Indigenous, Latino, Spanish speaking, or, or Hispanic, however they identify, aren't supported in the way that they need to be to be successful. It, it's really um, hard and fast, generally speaking, guardrails that these organizations operate in and under and expect everyone to, to, to adapt to that. Uh, creating sustained involvement. Again, we work, we partner uh, with, with organizations, with leaders. Uh, that help give us access, uh, that help bring a higher level understanding of priorities. And ultimately, we want to have more people working in the space, so jobs. Um, how do we do that? Um, our programs uh, really look to, you know, obviously we have our, our priorities, but we want people to feel uh, that they're getting something out of this. Most of the people that we engage don't have professional development opportunities or paid time off. Uh, La Academia de Defensores is a watershed stewards training model. We pay our participants to be with us, to, to learn, to be there virtually, to, in, to be there in person. This is a picture of uh, La Clase Alpha, which is our first um, cohort in the um, Anacostia watershed. Um, we are getting ready to recruit for our second class in the Anacostia watershed, and we're expanding to the Patapsco watershed, which is in the Baltimore, uh, Howard County, and Arundel County area uh, with the same thing. We'll have a uh, uh, glass out for that we're there. Um, another way we do that is this new program, Embajador de Arboles, which is uh, our tree ambassadors program, working with uh, various uh, community groups, church groups, uh, and municipalities, we have created a program that um, pays people to learn about the importance of trees, their ambassadors. So how do trees function, where to plant them, how to take care of them, and then their job is to go and engage their neighbors, their community, their family to say, hey, trees are important. Do you want to host a tree? So each one of them is, is tasked with finding a spot or a home for 20 trees. Our ambassadors will be paid $6,000 for their time, uh, which, you know, you can't live on it necessarily, but it is... Um, fair recognition we feel it's thirty dollars an hour and that's based on the um the federal volunteer rate which is 29 dollars and 50 some cents and change that organizations can claim as match for people picking up trash and planting trees so our rationale is if you're going to use that we're going to use that as a base to pay our participants or, or our ambassadors so these are these are again, recognizing that people's time is valuable. They have priorities that they need to address, which is rent, food, uh, car payment, etc. We're trying to help them accomplish that through these programs while also improving 
the environmental conditions while also building up the knowledge base of our participants while also building into these opportunities experiences for leadership and leading so again as was said uh, trust through authenticity uh, i'll just read these real quick um, uh, let your action, action speak for you keep your commitments uh, this is a great quote I love. Do the best you can until you know better. Then when you knew, know better, do better. Maya Angelou. Uh, this is my team. We're missing Val here. This is the best team in the world. Liz, Carlos, Val, Victor, and Carla. Um, and again, because I can't do this alone. Um, and that is it. So thank you bo to both of our um, oh, panel. One more thing. If you want to have, in, we have our two-year anniversary celebration at Sandy Point on the 20th. So if you want to join us, uh, scan the QR code and register to receive updates uh, or any other thing that we have going on. We have a lot of events uh, coming up in the fall. In the winter. Other events are beautiful. <laughs> awesome. Um, so thank you both for these wonderful presentations. Super um, informative and helpful. Um, so thank you again. And so now um, we will go to our Q&A. Um, and I just want to set this up uh, with two questions for the both of you all. And then I think if, if you all have any questions, we have uh, some plenty of time. <laughs> so um, please, um, you know, definitely feel free to think about what you want to ask. And um, you're all welcome to ask your questions. So um, the first question that I have for, for the both of you um, Latino residents in the DMV area are usually not provided with the same opportunities that their white counterparts are when it comes to policies and practices in home ownership mm -hmm. and education. For example, they often Latinos often lack access to affordable housing, safe and reliable transit, and park and green space that are necessary ne that are necessary to fully thrive and achieve health equity. Um, so the question is, can each of you share some measures to alleviate this long-standing condition? Hmm. Well, I think for me and, and the type of work I do, um, that's exactly what I spend all my time thinking about um, and trying to get to, to the nut of it. Um, a big challenge, I'll just be blunt, I feel we're invisible. Um, you know, um, when it comes to the policymakers, it's like we're an afterthought. And, um, and you know, yes, there's a Maryland Latino Legislative Caucus, if you look at it from a, you know, legislature. Um, and it's large, it's 60 plus people, uh, four of which are actually elected officials. So we do have a representation challenge. And as you saw from the survey, um, that was the second most important issue. Um, on the social and economic justice side of things. And, um, and that's gonna take time. That's a long-term plan. So in the immediate term, I think um, part of what we have to do is, is have conversations like this. Uh, we also have to continue, like what you were saying, it's listening to the community, hearing, not pop our needs on top of them or what we think the issues are. We study a lot and you know I, I go to conferences and I learn a lot um, and I see the horrors of the data and you know but what is it that people are feeling what are they talking about when they sit down to eat and, and you know they're having dinner and like how are they uh, what are their priorities because <coughs> your point Abel, their priorities may not be the big pictures priorities right and even though they agree on the climate change challenges and they agree that there's an environmental justice challenge. They also know that their kids, again, to your question, I'm just gonna quote you, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that their kids need to be fed, that they need jobs. You know, one thing we didn't talk about was how COVID impacted our community, not just the sickness itself, but economically, it really killed us. Latinas are still suffering. Latinas are not out of this. Our community has not bounced back. Our small businesses did not get access to the investments that the government agencies were making in other communities. Our small businesses, in fact, are, are woefully underrepresented in the actual grants that were received and were not reached out to so that they could learn how to apply. Um, that, you know, it was just so much harder for that community. And whether they were Chicano or whether they were recently, uh, you know, established immigrant businesses, 
Um, if you didn't have some big corporate back it, backer behind you, chances were you didn't get those resources. So that's a problem. Without those, you know, that kind of investment in our community, it makes everything harder. Now, I, I always talk about FUBU. FUBU mm -hmm. means for us, by us. And, um, and so I really, you know, I don't empower anybody, but I do fight on their behalf to get them the resources and the information that they need so that they can fight for themselves. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, once a person's invested in something, I think they're going to take it much farther than anything I could ever do. But I have privilege. I have a lot of privilege. I'm super mm -hmm. educated. I speak a bunch of languages. I've been all over the world. I mean, it's ridiculous. And um, not everybody has that access. So if I have access, it's my responsibility, I think, for me personally, to do what I can to make sure everybody else has the same kind of opportunities that I do. I can't follow up on that there. <laughs> no. um, um, and I, I apologize, I forgot what the question was. Oh, yeah. Um, I can read. Um, um, so uh, just Latino residents in DMV are usually not provided with the same opportunities that their white counterparts are when it comes to policies and practices in home ownership and education. For example, they often lack access to affordable housing, safe and reliable transit, and parks and green spaces that are necessary to fully thrive and achieve health equity. Can you share some measures to alleviate this, this long-standing condition? I mean, it, it's, um, I think that access to, to affordable housing, to green space, to all that has a lot to do with something that you mentioned earlier, redlining and land use policies that were established a long time ago. Um, they're not going to change anytime soon because the, 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 the power want to retain, the powerful want to retain the power. Um, they're not going to do it um, because uh, of the goodness of their heart. They have to be compelled to do it. Um, I think that that our elected officials somehow forget that having a sick populace is very expensive mm -hmm. um, and maintaining those those divisions and uh, infrastructure the way it is uh, will continue to result in higher rates of chronic disease for our communities and and until we get an understanding of, of that impact I, I think that it's it's really difficult to, to bring that. It's systemic. Mm -hmm. um, so what we can do is, you know, what, what Gabby's doing, what, what I'm doing, what others are doing is really working to build capacity at the community level for self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. It's not enough that we have a single great big Latino led organization. Mm -hmm. If we have money that's coming down the way, they're gonna, you know, the powers that be say, oh, fund that group because they do it all. That's the that's they a very the definition of bottlenecking resources. And then you get to the, the question of whether or not the organization in question likes another group or wants to, or even knows of another group. Yeah. Uh, so investing more in the, the development at the community level of organizations, thank you Gabby, and in leadership development to build capacity mm -hmm. uh, from within the community so that they can accomplish what they want in the manner that they want it. Uh, and I think that that's, I don't know if I answered the question. I think I got off track. Oh, that's but, great. But that's, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I have two more questions, but I definitely want to open it up to to folks in the audience. Um, what you think? Yeah, um, what did you see? We're all friends here, so if you guys want to grow up closer, team. whatever. Yeah, I can I can, I can. start. Uh, well, first, thank you so much, all of you, for, for talking. It's been great. I was a little late. The last session ran, ran, ran over, but um, I'm Marcelo. I live in the in, in DC, but I work uh, for a climate communications nonprofit uh, in New York. So I don't work in the DMV area, but, but I live here. And I lived in PG County for a year. But um, I guess 
my question was was more like trying to present like sort of look for advice on how to uh, work in a predominantly white space uh, trying to communicate and reach out to predominantly Spanish speaking audiences um, in in New York and upstate New York um, there's still like a, there's a big Hispanic community like I mean, like mostly everywhere but uh, most of the big greens and most of the areas that I work with are primarily English speaking and I've had scenarios and cases where they they've told me that uh, well like you know somebody who only spoke Spanish uh, talk try to talk to me and I work in buildings. So we work in a lot of like rebates, solar panels, uh, a lot of like tax and energy credits and information that is useful and can save money mm -hmm. to a lot of people, but that information is not available in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So when they talk to my partners, they're like, well, I can't help you because I don't speak the language. So what do I do? And, and in my case, my organization is also predominantly white and none of my managers speak Spanish. So I could make the materials, I could make the documents, but there's nobody to review them. There's nobody to like, so there's not a system, there's not a process. So I feel like there's a barrier that, I, that I'm having trouble crossing to try to reach those people, uh, both in terms of like, I'm not even like in the place or like states away, but also like, I, I, don't, I don't know how to like bridge that gap between them and the resources that they need. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, so, I think a lot about communications. In fact, I just hired my first communications manager. Um, she'll start on Monday. And she's fully bilingual and she's Afro Latina and she's amazing. Um, and she comes from New York City. Um, but, and, and that's part of that. I had to go out where I had to, like, you have to go where the people are who, who have more experience, right? Y aquí, pues, pues no, hay, no somos muchos. Um, and, um, and it's hard. It's hard uh, getting that message across because it, it doesn't come naturally to them, especially in the big green spaces, at least from my experience. And so even when they really want to do the right thing, um, el lenguaje es algo distinto, right? It's, um, it's, it changes how you think. And so one of the things I've been doing, I actually hired a Guatemalan firm from Guatemala to do my work here. From my website and we did our website from malvic in spanish not translated from english we actually started everything from scratch and we're translating the spanish to english which is easier because there's so much in english that you, you know just makes life pero en español para realmente entender a la comunidad como piensa la comunidad y como se comunica but there's another problem here Maybe this is my moment for disinformation. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of disinformation in our community because precisely for what you say. And then when it comes time for the political season, let us say everybody complains, Latinos don't turn out to vote. Well, claro que no. We don't communicate to them. But it's for anything. It's, 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 we, we don't communicate with our communities well enough. And the agencies, like in Maryland, one of the things I find, there's very few bilingual people in the agencies. And they just think, if you have, so, oh, well, she's fulanita, you know, she, well, they do it in English, but she speaks Spanish, let her do this translating. But if you're in a mental health situation, let's use that as an extreme example, um, you need someone who knows that area. Right. And you can't just be someone from the street you know, you can try, but this is sensitive. So the same thing I think goes in the environmental space, maybe not that sensitivity, but you're using a lot of legal language, you're using a lot of financial language, which is, uh, you know, it's a language in and of itself, right? Yeah. So again, it's really important to value it. What I do with managers is, uh, now I have, I have the ability because I'm old. <laughs> to intervene and just like cut through to the leadership to, at the top and just say, look, this needs to happen. And then you back it up with data. So if they're intent on the community, communicating with the community for business purposes, right? Or, you know, to expand the number of Latinos who get the product, the solar <coughs> roofs, or, you know, whatever, the efficiency in their homes. Uh, and you have to communicate to them in Spanish, you know, see what data you can find. Use data as your friend, because that'll back you up. I don't know, what do you think about it? 
I agree. I mean, if you're in the building exactly. sector and you're trying to do this, you know, engagement, um, they always listen to money. I mean, if there's money to be made, then, you know, there's a program to be created. Uh, I know that that's not the, the you know, you, you want to appeal to people's most uh, you know, ideal uh, self, uh, but the reality is that uh, if there's not a willingness to engage the community for the, the right reasons, you know, maybe there's a reason that's financial related. Um, and, and I would, I would also suggest that if you're comfortable with it, you know, do that, you know, material translation, you know, get connect with, with the community that way. But, uh, you know, be careful. I've heard some people fall into this cycle of being tapped as the Latino, the Latina, the person who's going to do, oh, just put it on the desk. They're going to do all the translations. They're, they're the touchstone. They're, they know what, you know, should we have uh, banda, mariachi, or salsa, or are we going to eat taquitos or pupusas? You know, like that. Now you're you know, getting sophisticated. You, you, know, you don't want to, you know, you, you, I, I caution you, you know, not, again, if it's something that you're comfortable with, but we, get, we have the tendency of being uh, thrown into the catch all of being representative of the Spanish speaking world, mm -hmm. which is impossible. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that, that looking to, um, to, to reach in the community uh, and encourage your, um, your, your organization to do that, uh, it, it's, it's tough. Um, maybe, maybe look for a mentor within the organization who is, um, gets it, who would be able to support you um and and also you know look to the side and mm -hmm. create you know a, a, a network internally and then look to someone who's younger or less experienced than you and then help them as well and in that you're able to build a coalition within your organization yeah. to make those gains right. yeah I, just a comment i i also come from like the green big green group world and have also faced like tokenism right and like Oh, I'm gonna look for you to translate this <laughs> when I'm like, I'm not a copywriter. Um, so I definitely agree with what Abel said of find your people, like because it's a definitely um, it's a cultural thing within organizations as well. And it can feel lonely to try to advocate for these things, but there's allies where you probably don't know there's allies, um, even like your white allies, right? Um, people that have power and you guys build power together, um, and that's how we, um, you know. Um, help to form a union within my our green group with our different allies so um not saying you have to unionize but um it is we formed a yeah a union within a green group so um yeah so i i would say like um it, it's a lonely but there's people there yeah um so we got a seven five minute warning right now um so is there anybody else that wants to ask a question if not i can um ask the closing question the plenary, the closing plenary, she says, starts in like seven minutes. Nope. Do you want to make comments? I have a comment. Oh, yeah, yeah please make a comment. Um, well, my name is Brenda Trejo Rosas, and I am um, Chicana. I'm from the West Coast, so Oregon, Idaho, Washington State, that area, Pacific Northwest, not California. But no, I am a student, a uh, doctoral candidate at GW in Environmental Health Sciences. I also have a master's from there in Global Environmental Health. And so like in our field, one, we're still addressing like equity, just equity for anyone, right? And getting folks to understand what that means and the root causes of health inequities. Um, and then also working with um, like the Latino community, it, it's very much like not working with. It's um, extracting from the community for research purposes and stuff. Yeah. Um, there's folks that do like community-based participatory research, but that's not necessarily like a big deal. And um, 
I don't know, I'm just glad to be hearing from you all in the DMV area because even as a student in environmental health sciences, I know like definitely my school is not engaged enough in the community for their students to know mm. about opportunities to work with the community. So, mm. um, yeah, no, I'm super excited and hope, and just excited to see that there are folks working with the community in environmental health. So do they do research here for the Latino community or? Have you encountered? Let me put it this way. Have you encountered it? <laughs> no, uh, uh, no. So, like my department specifically, the environmental and occupational health department. No. Uh, uh. Um, yeah. No. Thank you. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you for that comment. And you know, if um, I don't know if you all have cards or if there's any way to keep in touch, I'm happy to give you my information. Um, and yeah, and I think just to kind of end this session, I'd love to end like on a positive note. Um, so can you each share a hope that you have for the future of Latinos in the DMV? I have lots of hopes <laughs> um, and dreams. Um, I think my hope is that um, because it's such a young, vibrant, new community, right? I mean, I you know my experience, I've worked in over 40 states with Latino communities, right? Uh, this is my first time in Sin Embargo, es la primera vez que trabajo en Maryland. Uh, because I, I lived in D.C. and worked in D.C. for 10, almost 20 years. Um, so it's kind of interesting to take all that experience here and be able to, to provide support in any way I can. And thinking, strategic thinking. But my hope would be that um, because it's an opportunity, right? I mean, it's carte blanche in some ways, and, you know, Tabula rasa. And uh, there's that, you know, you can say, oh, that's terrible, or you can say, what a great thing. We can create our own thing. You know, um, the community itself can, can build its own way. And, uh, you know, the one thing I love about Maryland, people are pretty welcoming here. I mean, there's pockets. Sadly, in Frederick, you have a crazy sheriff. Um, <laughs> um, um, you know, um, the, they're welcoming, you know, this whole business with the Abbott buses and the Ducey buses. They've been so welcoming to these folks. They've, they've, they've spent whatever resources they had here. Most of them have left. Most of these folks just bus through. But the ones that stay behind have been welcomed into the community. And, um, and it's hard for them. And we know that. And there's not a whole lot of resources. But people's hearts are open for the most part. And I think that's, as long as that's there, we can do a lot. Yeah, um, positive note. I think that there is a opportunity to um, to really take advantage of the resources that are being put into things that are being labeled as environmental justice, uh, social justice, uh, as an opportunity to invest in the community to build uh, that capacity for the future, you know, I think that that now it's it's the the, the, the soup du jour, um, and let's use it. Let's use that opportunity to build the network to mm -hmm. uh, enhance our abilities and capacities, and and really grow our our own system in the way that we want to, in the way that's familiar, um, so that we have more. Because this is going to go away, I feel. You know, they're, they're going to get tired of, of serving the, you know, the, you know, the the, the, the communities of color. Uh, we'll say I feel that, that it's always it's historically been short lived, um, and I think that we as a, as a country have, have trended that way and will continue to trend that way. Um, so we use the opportunity now to build the capacity. Uh, so that we can be in a position to demand mm -hmm. going forward, mm -hmm. and so that when that time comes, we will be showing up at the the meetings and at the voting booth and and making our choices and decisions uh, to to who who's going to lead us and, and represent us. I like that. Yeah. Well, thank you both. This has been really great. I've learned so much, and thank you to our audience. And I think um, y'all want to head down to the. 
last plenary. Um, but I, I can stick around if folks want to exchange contacts. Um, I'm happy to share my contacts as well. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't have a business card. <laughs> you know, we've been doing, we started the organization virtually, and um, I, I have never um, actually put it all together. Yeah, I, He's I, a smart man. He's got his yeah, and No, I, I, so I follow his <laughs> on, uh, on all the social media. I like, I, I comment, so I, 